and we are live greetings and salutations and of course and uh, welcome to this very special stream discussing our matriarchies i'm very very excited about this um for reasons that will become apparent in a moment particularly excited about our guest here today lynn how are you doing i'm great thanks very much and it's really good to be here i'm really looking forward to it oh it's such a pleasure i'm so excited let me introduce my guest properly because uh yeah stuff <laughs> lynn foxhall is the rathbone professor of ancient history and classical archaeology at the university of liverpool she also serves as editor of the journal of hellenic studies cambridge university press previously she was the dean of the school of histories languages and cultures at liverpool and led the uni university-wide heritage research theme Professor of Greek Archaeology and History at the University of Leicester and head of the School of Archaeology and Ancient History, where she played a major part in leading the team that discovered the body of King Richard III of England. She has held posts at St. Hilda's College, Oxford and University College, London and visiting professorships in Germany, Denmark and the US. She studied at Bryn Mawr College, the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Liverpool. She also has the dubious honour <laughs> of being my mother Yay. hey mommy how are you doing i'm good boo how are you <laughs> so this is my mom everybody uh she's very patient she's put up with me for you know some years um and uh we thought that since we were talking uh, since it's just been mother's day right um wouldn't it be fun to do a talk about you know moms and matriarchies with my mom who is also you know very very qualified to talk about matriarchies as you just heard um and uh yeah so that's what we're gonna be talking about today second hand samurai, samurai says uh, mum triarchies in world building <laughs> i am here for it absolutely um, the uh the chat says hi janet's mom <laughs> hi chat good to have you all out there and janet is by the way an absolutely awesome daughter and i meet so many people in your community when i go various places who are really thrilled that i'm janet's mom that's really fun anyway yeah so that's what i could do this all day i guess just chat with my mom but i shouldn't do that we're talking about matriarchies <laughs> so um let's start with a definition because that's always a very useful place to start when we're talking about topics like this how do we define a matriarchy what is a matriarchy right okay so matriarchy is a kind of idea about how societies in the past might have been organized and it all goes back to a man called Bacoffin. And he was writing in the 19th century when people were very, pe Charles Darwin had just discovered evolution and people were very excited about this. And lots of people decided that they would think about whether there was an evolutionary sequence of societies from the deep past up to their own present that operated in the same way as biological evolution. Now, in fact, we now know that that's doesn't work like that. Human society development is much more complicated and it doesn't always go the same direction. But Bakhoffen was one of the things that he did was to imagine that in the human past, societies had had developed from being very primitive and very simple which are terms we don't use anymore because even so-called simple societies are unbelievably complicated. Yes, absolutely. But going from very so-called primitive societies to more sophisticated societies like kingdoms and chiefdoms and then to societies that were kind of modern and industrial. And of course, they always saw the pinnacle of achievement as being their own world. Right. The Again, thing they were, that's what everybody was trying to become. To be. Somehow. Exactly. Right. Exactly, Janet. Spot on. Now, what Backhoffen Im imagined was that matriarchy was a very early stage of the so-called primitive societies. And you knew it was a very early stage and bad because the idea was, as the name suggests, that it was the rule of women. It was women who were in control. 
Now, in fact, as far as we know from anthropology, that's the study of, of different kinds of societies around the world in the, in the present day and the recent past, from history and also from archaeology, there is no evidence that there was ever a truly matriarchal society in reality where women controlled everything and ruled and men were the subordinate group. However, there have been a lot of societies which are called by anthropologists and archaeologists matrilineal. And this isn't so much about women ruling, it's about how things like kinship, kinship and relatedness work. So the idea is that in the societies of, for example, Western Europe and North America and much of, much of the modern Western world, the way you're related to people like mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles is reckoned through both of your parents. So your mother's sister is your aunt, but your father's sister is also your aunt. Yeah. Now, in a lot of societies, it doesn't work like that. And kinship varies incredibly. And there are some societies, there aren't as many as there are what are called bilateral, like ours, or or patrilineal, where you only reckon relatedness through the male line. But there are some societies where being related mostly goes through the female line. So the really important relative is your mother, and the person who acts as your father, your social father, is actually your mother's brother, who we would call your uncle, but in, in social terms in many of these societies, that guy would be your, your father or have that role in that title. Um, and there are lots of societies that are in between that, that reckon female relations for some things and male relations for others. Basically, how humans organize themselves and think they're related to other people is just unbelievably complicated and almost yeah. infinitely variable. So you world builders, this is a great pool of interesting information to draw upon because there are so many variations in the real world that when you take off into building a world of your own, there are many, many models that you can choose from and adapt. So yeah. that's basically what a matriarchy is. And although they were imagined in the past in, as, as being a type of society in the past, they probably really weren't. And our society is not the only one that imagined matriarchy. So for example, ancient Greeks imagined that, for example, this, the Amazons, these, these warrior women, were a society of entirely women where men were completely subservient and only there for producing children and that they kept all the daughters and that it was a kind of inverse of the way much more patrilineal and patriarchal societies actually worked in the ancient world. And they were, it must be said, imaginary. These are not real people. Now, that's not to say that women did not do exciting things or what we would call have agency, because they certainly did in ancient societies. But that's not the same as a matriarchy. Yeah, absolutely. So does that make sense? It, I think I think that you've stated that beautifully. Um, ECC books. Uh, no, where was it? Uh, there was a wonderful comment here that I have now immediately lost, of course. It'll um, turn up. I agree with ECC, a true teacher, apparently. So they're following you. They know what good, you're saying. Good. They're with you. So there was, um, funnily enough, there was raised somewhere. Um, what about if a kingdom is led by queens and ladies as the preferred ruler? Would that be considered a matriarchy? Or, for example, if the current queen were, if the current ruler were a queen? No, not necessarily. Um, again, I, it's 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 so variable from one society. Don't worry about that. Carry on. That's okay. Um, it's so variable from one society to another. Um, in many societies, including many Western European ones, but in other societies as well, you often end up with queens by accident because there are no men 
who can take over. On the other hand, you sometimes end up with queens because you have remarkable women who just take over. So, for example, there was a there was a female pharaoh in in the New Kingdom called Hatshepsut, and Hatshepsut was actually her husband had died, and she was the regent basically for her little yeah. minor son. And she decided it would be much more fun to be king than it would be to be just a boring like old regent. The Uber mother, basically. The yeah. Uber mother. And and she did it, she did a damn good job of it too. She was actually a very good pharaoh. And there are really interesting images of her, complete with all the pharaonic regalia and her own special false beard that pharaohs had to wear. But that in itself is really interesting because it suggests that the basic ideology of that king role is a masculine one and in order to take it on she had to put on that false beard you gotta have a beard to be a pharaoh even if you're a lady even if you're a lady go. so and yeah. and there are there are many examples of powerful women yeah. um most of them most of them are were elite women to start yeah. with so again it's kind of what we would call intersectional so gender and gendered behaviors intersect with things like wealth, status, class. And if you're from a wealthy elite family, a royal family, something like that, the same rules don't necessarily apply to you yeah. as a woman as they might do to a less a less a, a woman in a less favored position, a peasant woman, you know, a working woman, whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. So there were queens and there, there were, were important women, a lot of them. Uh, I current, my, my novel is, is all about important women from history. They're there, guys. We've got to find them. They're really inspiring. But what we're talking about is the society as a whole is a space yeah. where almost always women's rights are different and often secondary to men. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about rights and agency? In the past. Sure. Well, and in many, in in most societies in the past, um, and indeed even in many societies today, including to a significant extent our own still, um, women are at a disadvantage. In many societies in the past, their rights were explicitly curtailed. So women couldn't necessarily own property, for example, or or have agency in terms of handling money or or setting up businesses or or all sorts of other things. Voting, um, for example. Yeah. Women didn't necessarily have control over who they married. That was decided by somebody else. But then sometimes that was also decided for men, you know, that it was it was parents' right to do that. So age is another thing, and it is often the case in many societies that women become more powerful with age. Mm. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So you can have a really fierce, what we, what we would often call a matriarch, you know, a really powerful grandma whose husband, who might be quite a lot older, is a bit daughtery, and she's the one that really runs the show and runs the shop. And, and this is something, a phenomenon that appears in lots of societies. But again, it's highly variable. Again, there are a number of, of African societies where women have very, very important positions and, and women are the ones who are really the entrepreneurs. And women themselves can marry wives who can take on that subordinate wifely role to help them out while they get on with growing the business this is this is 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 a known phenomenon again in matrilineal societies it's often the case that women can own property and and have power to dispose of it and and have a lot more what we would call agency to decide what they want to do but one of the interesting things is that even in societies where on the face of it, I know, couldn't we all use a wife? Me too. Um, but where on the face of it, even where, where women's rights and legal ability to do things 
including act as a citizen. I mean, in most societies until re very recently, women could not participate in politics or vote, or certainly in the ancient world, couldn't formally take part in, in civic affairs and things like that. It's quite complicated. No. Even in societies like this, there are still ways in which women carve out agency in all sorts of different ways. You know, women are not doormats. No, absolutely not. But um, what they are allowed to do varies significantly by place and time absolutely. and social status and age. So these are the things that we can think about when we start to think about the agency, not just of women, but of all of our characters is, you know, who are they within the context of their own society? And how does that change based on, as as you said before so astutely, um, where they are, what time they are, how old they are, what social class are they in? Mm. Exactly. And there's all sorts of ways of, of resisting the rules as well, which is quite interesting. And sometimes they're quite under the radar. Yeah. So one of the things we talked about in our previous call was about motherhood and why that may have affected, you know, the power of women, like like essentially the, the parameters of, for example, verification of fatherhood and how that's something that has, you know, traditionally caused less agency for women. Can you speak a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I again, um, one of the things that's very interesting is that is that in human societies, biology is not is not determinative. Biology never determines anything because we're humans, and that's not to say we're beyond biology, but biology certainly provides some what we would call affordances. That is to say, it can encourage people or societies to go down one route rather than another one. Yeah. And that's that's not determinative by any means. And we know it's not determinative because of the enormous variation in social practices right across time and space, like you would not believe, you know, yeah. if there's a way of doing it, honestly, people have probably come up with it and you guys can invent some more. But one of the things about human beings, in fact, any animals, any mammal, is that it's really easy to verify motherhood, like women get pregnant and they have the baby and there are people there helping them. Human beings can't actually have babies without people helping them. And that's one of the things that's really, really interesting about early humans and early hominins is that we see evidence in things like healed bones, for example, or all sorts of all sorts of other conditions that show up skeletally that people were in tight enough kinship and social groups that they helped each other. This is this is very clear. And that sociality was a very tight bond. So women cannot actually give birth. Modern women cannot actually give birth very easily without having help most of the time. Damn upright walking, honestly. Yeah, so it is. It is. It is partly. Up, it is partly down to upright walking, but it's it's all sorts of other things too, in terms of the way human pelvises have evolved and the fact that, interestingly, over over time, from the very earliest hominins, that is to say, different species of humany things that were before Homo sapiens, it's become more and more difficult for women to give birth. Yeah. which is really interesting evil in terms of biological evolution and that means that we're much more dependent on our social relationships and our social links for that so it's very easy for human societies to verify motherhood what is very difficult is to verify fatherhood and lots of societies that we would classify as being not just patrilineal but ideologically patriarchal where, where men get it into their heads that they have to kind of like control women and repress them and things like this. And this, again, has been a feature of, of societies, certainly well back into the ancient past where we have evidence of this. 
a lot of this surrounds surrounds verification of fatherhood. So, for example, in ancient Greece, where I work, in order to be a citizen in most ancient Greek city-states, you had to have a citizen father, and in some places also a citizen mother, but you certainly had to have a citizen father. Now, fatherhood is the really hard bit to verify. Yes. And so you get you you actually get lawsuits about this, like claiming that so-and-so's father really isn't his father and therefore he's not entitled to be a citizen, or you get you get all sorts of, of paranoia about women the, the fatherhood of a woman's child tell and them, tell them about the richard the third thing because that's hilarious oh yes i will yes that was one of the interesting discoveries in richard the third and that's a really good example of it when we discovered richard the third the geneticist turi king who did the the um genetic analysis and this is all published open access in nature you can look it up online and read the original scientific article about it one of the things that we managed to do was to find two descendants of Richard III's sister who were descendants right down the female line, mother, daughter, mother, daughter, mother, daughter, all the way down. Now, one of the things that's quite cool is that when you pass on your genes to your children, mitochondrial DNA, this is little bits of these are little bodies that float around in cells and they have their own DNA that's different from the nuclear DNA that is what is formed when an egg and a sperm combine. Mitochondrial DNA comes only from your mother. Yes. And so if you have a mother, daughter, mother, daughter, mother, daughter line down umpteen generations, then you can be pretty sure that if the the mitochondrial DNA of your skeleton matches the mitochondrial DNA of your descendant, then that they're actually genuinely related to each other because it's not warped by being constantly recombined by sexual reproduction. Okay. It's just reproduced. So it, it's, it's just reproduced more or less intact. Track that matrilineal line. You can track the matrilineal yes. line very clearly. Yeah. When we when we Don't actually yeah we are referring to archaeological excavation of Richard III. So when they they did the genetic analysis of the mitochondrial DNA of the skeleton we thought might be Richard the Third with these two matri matriline descendants, the DNA of both of them matched in one case absolutely exactly. In the other case, out of thousands and thousands of base pairs, one base pair different, which is just a yeah. little mutation. I was going to say that's so, a standard genetic mutation. Yeah, exactly. So that was clearly Richard III. On the female line, it was definitely Richard. It was definitely Richard III. However, when they tested various bits of um, living nobility who claimed to be descended from Richard III and whose paper genealogies showed they were related to Richard III, there were what were euphemistically described as some false paternity events in this, because clearly somebody's mom had had it off with somebody who wasn't her husband, and the baby was somebody else's. So they couldn't get a match on the paternal line from modern descendants but they definitely could on the matrilineal line. That was really interesting. Yeah. So and that's it a, just a goes genetic, to show. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's a, it, that's a genetic example of exactly what we're talking about, where you can verify female parentage. You cannot verify male parentage. And even in royal and noble lines where they do, they do their darndest, you know, this is really important stuff. There's a lot of power at stake. Even yeah. then, false paternity events they can slip through and that's, they can that's slip sort through. of the setup for what we're talking about really exactly and if you think about it in the ancient world where you know you don't have dna or paternity testing or even blood testing or anything like that you know there was always especially where there was inheritance money power at, at, at stake 
concern about making sure that the children a woman produced were actually the children of the father they were supposed to be the who the person who was supposed to be their father their biological yeah. father and and that itself is really interesting so yeah. so i think that's one reason why in many societies where belonging depends on fatherhood you end up with lots of social rules that restrict women because they they are because they can't verify fatherhood um things like looking after small children or even breastfeeding are less of an issue and i think the reason for that is because in many societies of the past it wasn't just the mother's job to look after children yeah. that families often operated even if families lived in in what we would call nuclear family households mom dad and the kids you would still have a raft of other close relatives cousins aunts uncles as we would call them people who were related living close by and often these groups would would share child care and there's quite a lot of evidence that they would do things like share breastfeeding so so you know if somebody can't breastfeed or gets very ill in a, in a in a society where you don't have modern baby food or formula what do you do well you hand it over to somebody else your sister or whatever who is still breastfeeding a child and she feeds it until you're better and this is something that clearly happened in in many societies um and children are not always entirely raised by their families again you get you get lots of societies where for a period they go off and live with another family elsewhere um a different a different clan or a different group with which your clan has some kind of generic bigger relationship so that children get fo fostered and of course ultimately you always want to find a marriage partner outside your own group Right, of course, because no. you need the genetic variants, if nothing else. Exactly. And in most patrilineal groups, um, women move to the man's house yeah. or household. In a, lot of pat in a lot of matrilineal societies, it works the other way around. Yeah. And you also get societies and, and variations on them. So, for example, even within relatively recent modern Greek societies, um, it was the case that 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 most of the time you had what would, you would call patrilocal marriage. That is to say, the woman moves to the man's house, hmm. um, except in some of the Greek islands where the women owned all the houses. The men right. owned the agricultural fields, but the women owned the houses. And that's something very interesting that I thought was um, something that we've discussed before is that um, it can be that women can't own property, and this is this is genuinely something that we see in history. Um, but it can also be that different people are allowed to own different stuff. Dif different yes. different sexes are allowed to do different things, and some things are considered the space of the woman or the space of the man. And therefore, you know, this thing becomes even more complicated because yes. it's very hard to use a simple word like matriarchy to talk about complex power structures exactly exactly and, and yeah, go ahead and i was just going to say and the infinite variation in in how people relate to each other and and there are always ways of getting around the rules yeah yes absolutely especially if you're elite or wealthy or also if you're very poor so let's talk about two examples of that um, the powerful women I picked out, like off the cuff, were Cleopatra and Boudicca. Um, yep. Would their societies be considered matriarchal if they were in charge? Absolutely she, not. Well, Cleopatra, we've up. already Cleopatra, we've already talked about, Disgust, of course. Yeah. Cleopatra is really interesting because, unlike Hatshepsut, she doesn't become the ruler or the pharaoh. She has a perfectly good husband. Um, who was also her brother in that case, because that was yeah. a peculiar habit of Egyptian. In the family. <laughs> a, 
that was it. Yeah, that was a peculiar habit of, of Egyptian royalty that they they tended to have these brother sister marriages, and that interestingly enough continued right down into the period when the Greeks under Alexander the Great and his successors ruled Egypt, and also when the Romans ruled Egypt. And of course, Cleopatra was a queen at a time when when the Romans were trying to take over Egypt. Yes, and and. She had this perfectly good husband, perfectly, you know, legal and legitimate husband, who was the pharaoh. Um, but she ended up having various, again, interestingly enough, she was kind of political agent on her own. And she ended up having affairs with people like Mark Antony, Julius Caesar. She 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 was she was very manipulative. So she was a queen, but she was never the ruler of Egypt. She was never the ruling person. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Boudicca is another matter. She's she's a really interesting character because she is from a a British Iron Age society, um, living in the east of England. And again, a very sophisticated society where you had elites and commoners and, and elites were, were, were very well off. It's what we would call a stratified society where you had different classes of people. Yeah. And she was one of the elites. And again, I think she's another kind of Elizabeth I. She is somebody who ends up as an important as an important ruler and interestingly enough in her case military ruler yeah. because she is already somebody who is a royal person who is a who is is in that kind of chiefly clan group and and presumably ended up in that position because there was there was really there was really nobody else to succeed her and she really flummoxed the romans which is very interesting yeah, so she, again, she was one who ended up, and this is something that we've touched on already, uh, not through, uh, through a combination of agency and desperation. Um, because once her husband died, he left um, his, what was nominally his, but already the Romans were um, moving in little kingdom to his daughters. And the Romans went, right, we're going to ignore that. This is ours now. Um, and she said no. And exactly. that is how she ended up le leading in a military capacity uh, a whole kingdom. It wasn't it yes. was because everything else had gone wrong. Um, exactly. And that's what you often see with these women in history, these very strong, amazing women, is that they end up where they are either through their own agency or through desperation or through a combination of the two. Yeah. And in, in her case, again, I think the Romans completely did not expect her to do that. No. And that's one of the Fair reasons enough. why why they were like, oh my god, she what can do it. Yeah. There's another there's another really interesting Greek example of this in the Persian Wars. There was um, a, a woman called Artemisia who was an admiral. She actually she actually she was, and again she was also part of royalty from a, an area of southwest Turkey. Mm. called called Caria and she was she was also somebody who was from what was a local royal family yeah. and she is somebody else who who um was absolutely terrifying is is commemorated even in Greek tragedy because she was clearly an unbelievably effective admiral and seafaring was not something that the Persians, who come from the Tigris, you, you know, are in the middle of Mesopotamia and nowhere near the sea, were very good at doing. So they were very dependent on other people for their okay. fleet. And she was clearly incredibly effective. Yeah. But again, absolutely what, amazing. what's critical about all of these absolutely badass women is that they were exceptions. Yeah. They were they were acting outside what was the norm for their cultures. Yes, although although there are lots of ways in which women also, even even more ordinary women, as it were, take on live their own lives and do the things they want to do and and keep up their own relationships. So 
Um, one of the things that's that's very clear is that in in societies where you have patrilocal marriage, where women marry away from home someplace else um, to a different area, a different person, there are often things like rituals which bring mothers and daughters back together. So in ancient Greek, you had one called the Thesmophoria, which was literally all about mothers and daughters. It was about, about Demeter, the goddess of cereals and Persephone. And the myth behind it is the very famous story of how Persephone was kidnapped by the, the, the Hades and taken to the underworld. And then they came to a compromise in the end where she spent part of the year above ground and part of the year with her husband in the underworld. Very, very, yeah, don't eat the pomegranates for sure. A very famous myth. But one of the things is that that religious festival, which was universal in the Greek world, every single city and local village had its own version of the Thesmophoria, a little bit like Christmas. And, and that was a festival where mothers and daughters all get together. And one of the things that I discovered is that through very simple weaving tools called loom weights, Janet has seen far too many of them, I'm afraid. I, I said I should just tell them, tell them this. Whenever I go to a, a museum and I find loom weights, I send a picture to my mother because my mother is obsessed with loom weights because that's super interesting. And now she's going to tell you why. Yes. And one of the reasons that they're super interesting is because they move around with women. Yeah. And it's pretty clear that in certainly a number of parts of the Greek world, when women got married, they took some of their probably mother's loom weights with them when they got married and they enter a new weaving group because the kind of big upright looms that Greeks wove on, you can only you can only weave in groups. It's not something you can do quietly on your sewing machine by yourself. It's it's a group thing. And when you're in a new weaving group, you know, you're bringing your own tools from outside to some extent. You're taking things that came from your the home you were born in. And and you're also building relationships with new people. You're bringing in new ideas about, you know, I know a new pattern that you guys don't know and things like this. And it's really, really important in terms of the way women learn and develop. And these these weaving groups, certainly in Greek societies and and other societies of of that period, it's very, very clear that this was an area where where women were doing what women should do, but they were also using it as opportunities to socialize, to meet with families, to build relationships, to build friendships, and all of these things that men didn't really want them to do, but they did it. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about history and, and what has been in the cultures that we know about. Um, and history is a great place to mine for ideas. It's a fascinating place to go and visit wouldn't want to live there. Um, let's talk a little bit about the imagination, because that's more our scope as world builders. What, what would a matriarchal society or how could a matriarchal society work? Oh, I think there are lots of things that you could do as world builders, even, you know, being inspired by the breadth and variety and wonderfulness of human society, there are all sorts of ways that you could go way beyond this. So, for example, um, what it, by just starting with different premises. So what if it were the case that it were really easy to confirm paternity, but not maternity? So if you had, for example, fish people um, with lots of kinds of fish, you know, females go around and they lay a bunch of eggs and then they lay a bunch of eggs someplace else and all the rest of it. But it's the man fish who spreads his sperm over it, who is the one that then ends up looking after them and taking care of them. This is certainly the case with things like seahorses, because he knows that that bunch of, of fish eggs are going to turn into things that are his children. Now, if you had sentient fish people, there are all sorts of incredible ways you could do that or other things. Egg laying, egg laying societies. Um, uh, other ways of, of confirming 
paternity or not confirming maternity. Yeah, absolutely. So, And the minute you start thinking about a range of different genders, and this is something we haven't discussed, but I've been talking about human societies as if there were only two genders. And in no society was this ever true. And we know, we know from all sorts of, of sources, evidence from, again, recent past, um, well-documented societies historically and anthropologically, ethnographically, but also from past societies, that there were many, many different kinds of gendered roles that were, were non-binary, that were, were trans, that were crossover, that were even things beyond our own categories of gender that were just completely, utterly different. And the minute you introduce groups like that, then, then and groups like that that can reproduce or reproduce in different ways, then of course you certainly have a much more complicated kind of society. I mean, how how would Amazons reproduce? You know, they could reproduce in completely different ways that would have nothing to do with human biology. You know, you're not limited to human biology in a fantasy world. And that's the great thing about world building. Yeah, absolutely. Never a true word spoken, can I just? (laughs) But um, again, like we have we have so much latitude for creation. And if we start by throwing a spanner in the works of you know this traditional male female pairing where we know who the mother is but we don't know who the father was if we can shake that up we have the potential to create something really exciting and interesting and really unique societies extrapolated from this space i think that's that's super cool yeah or if you have or if you have other ways of reproducing yeah yeah absolutely Absolutely. So, for example, so, you know, for example, if the way you reproduce is is from, as it were, a piece of an individual. What if what if you have a society that's a, a world that's made up of beings who, like lizards, for example, can regrow parts of their body, but if they take away a part of their body chop off a part of their body that could then create another human being that is not necessarily a clone but is 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 you know that that you can shape its gender or its sex or whatever there are many many ways you could do this yeah absolutely and uh again our livers do this already if you have 10 percent of a liver you could grow a new liver it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that you know if i take the end of my tail and you take the end of your tail regardless of what gender we are we could make a new lizard that's not yes, bad exactly well earthworms or whatever yeah, yeah absolutely um mm. so one of the things that we talked about is biology but i think one of the other very important things to talk about is cosmology because let's take humans as an example our biology is pretty much more or less same everywhere we're, humans are humans. We are a species. We have recognizably similar biology. Absolutely. And yet, we have so many different ways of understanding sexes and genders and societies and cultures. You know, and we have had all of these different ways in different eras in our world. So what about examining things like cosmology and the cosmological position of sexes in the world as well? No, I think that's a really important point. And and it is certainly the case that, you know, while biology at one level is, as it were, a, a, a kind of physical fact, our perception of our biology is completely filtered through culture and ideology and cultural beliefs about our biology that that we grow up with that is how we learn to think about our biology and it doesn't matter whether human biology is intrinsic you know is in intri- i mean we know the human biology is intrinsically pretty much the same with comparatively minor variations across all of the human species but how people perceive this how they 
they constructed in their minds is, of course, and in their cultures is completely, utterly different in different times and places. Absolutely. And of course, you can also construct construct different kinds of groups. So, for example, how you construct your deities, how you construct the supernatural world, yeah. you know, does it follow the same gender rules as as your human beings world. do yes exactly. exactly i mean for example again in in the greek world one of the interesting things is that that monsters are often construed as kind of female but they're really scary females and they're females with kind of masculine characteristics so the the figures of gorgons the medusa are are terrified you know they're that you see them on temples they're frontal facing with big goggly eyes and stabby teeth and they're apotropaic that is to say they're up on these temples and buildings because they scare away bad things probably but they're also as monsters monsters that are when you look at the way they're sculpted they have breasts they're clearly female bodies but they're also really muscular like yeah. the way you would normally sculpt a male body. So they play with that kind of gender imagery and how they're they're construed. You get characters in Greek mythology like Tiresias, the prophet that nobody believed, who actually change gender and then change back again. So so other societies thought about gender and and thought about motherhood and matriarchy and 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 all of these things in very complex ways so yeah so the cosmology bit and of course when you get down to things like actual religious ritual often people who take on specific religious or ritual roles um are people who then end up in a differently gendered position so people for example in rome like the vestal virgins were women who were again chastity and and their chastity was sacrosanct they were supposed to be virgins and all the rest of it the reward for this in a sense or reward as it was framed in in roman male terms was that they had all the rights that men did yeah and that's really interesting yeah, so because there was there was that blending essentially like it's a woman oh but is it i think for me one of the really interesting examples of this is to compare something like the christian cosmology of man so man was made by god human uh, woman was made from man um woman is therefore subservient inferior broken damaged in some way and this is something that you know persists within the bible as a concept that women is somehow yeah. lesser is 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 the broken version it's the it's the bargain basement human that we don't need to worry about as much it's not as important and if you can can um compare that to for example things like um you know the, like the divine feminine and this kind of stuff all of a yeah. sudden you're, you're seeing these completely different interpretations yeah. what is the same biology we're, we're all humans at the end of the day and these exactly. kinds of cosmologies this is what can bring so many different, even if all the biology is the same, forget the fish people for a second, cool though they are, even if all of the biology is exactly the same and you only have humans in your world building, pulling in these different philosophies and cosmologies for religions, pulling in different origin stories, pulling in different interpretations of this biology, that's going to create the variance in societies that's going to be super interesting for your world. And it's going to stop yeah. it being like, and a patriarchy, and a patriarchy, and a patriarchy, and a slightly more equal patriarchy, which is a less interesting world than we could otherwise create, right? But you could also have things like, for example, specific associations or clan groups or religious groups that 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 have special special, as it were, privileges or special rules. That 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 certainly happens. That certainly happens in the past yeah. in real life, as yeah. it were. There are there are all kinds of ways in which in which people redefine their gender in special ways, and it often ends up related to related to um, religion. And 
you know, mirroring deities. I mean, again, the 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 deities, you know, Artemis and Apollo, the divine twins, children of Leto. Apollo is quite fierce and mean, but he's also the lyre player and the musician and things like this. The god of, the god of both illness and healing. Yeah. Artemis, Artemis is the huntress. Really yeah. interesting with her bow and 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 the the perpetual teenage stroppy girl who never grows up to be a wife and a mother, which is also really interesting, and yet also ends up being worshipped as a goddess of childbirth. Yeah. It it becomes very 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 complicated these things. Yeah. So so and and you can play with those complications. So if you have special groups, they they may have special rules. Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is a way that you can introduce variants, not only in a wider society, but in sects and in corners of your society and in different religions within societies. Um, and as, as has been said on this live stream before, sometimes you'll create something that seems a little bit contradictory. But do you know what? The world is also a little bit contradictory. I don't, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but um, the world is full of fascinating variances and things that don't at face value seem to make sense until you dig into them. So like there is a lot of potential for some really interesting world settings here. Now, I must do some audience questions or there will be riot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I could easily talk about this for uh, another hour because it is absolutely fascinating. But let's do some questions. Um, this one from Hadna Falm, who asks, do matrilineal cultures take uh, tend to place less importance in linear, lineage beyond the immediate family since there are less protectionist concerns in defining who is whose? That's a really good question and a really interesting question. And weirdly the answer is no um matrilineal networks often are end up very widespread and and very very powerful in the lives of individuals now as, again in some matrilineal societies this gives women extra privileges and rights but not in all um it's 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 highly variable but they often do go well beyond the immediate family and often they they end up with clan links elsewhere especially if you have a, a matrilineal society that also practices what we call exogamous marriage where you marry outside your own community into another community but those female links are really important and then you get these like really networks of women I was going to say, it's important to mention that um, when you marry uh, in a lot of societies, this is a connection between two families. Ooh, so yes. uh, my family, I, you, I married Demetrius. You know Demetrius. He's the nice, handsome Greek man. Uh, I married a nice, handsome Greek man. Now my mother is related to my mother-in-law. In, in Greek culture, they're related. We I are. am also related to the best man at my wedding. We are not blood relations. Nobody in his family has married my family. He's my combados, so we're related. Um, there's a lot of these kinds of relationships which are very important. And you might be asking yourself, well, well why is this important? Why would you do this? This is your social network. This, this is your social network. So and again, people, people expand it with things like fostering. Yes. So lineage and social relationships are highly desirable things. I know we all joke about mother-in-laws. Actually, mine is perfect, but we all joke about mother-in-laws, right? We all can go, oh, I have to go see my family. But uh, you have to understand in most contexts, family is, is, is a strength, it's power, it's strategic alliances. These are the people that you turn to. These are the people you rely on. So you want this lineage and you want these relationships because this gives you social kudos and power and agency, which is gonna help you get stuff done. So, and it's also, um, it's also your safety net in a world absolutely. where you don't have things like insurance companies. Yeah, absolutely. So in a, in a pre-modern world, if you go bust, who's gonna get you out of debtor's prison? It's your comparos, it's your simpadi, it's you know your 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 mm. mother-in-law, or you know, or if the person who is tangentially related to you in some way. Or if your crop fails, then your networked person 
over the other side of the river, five villages away, whose crop did not fail because that hailstorm didn't hit their patch, but it hit yours. They're the ones who are going to tide you over for that year. This is why it's important to have these wider networks in, in certainly pre-modern societies. You need those networks. Yeah, exactly. And um, as Muddy Holmes says, godparents are may maybe the most famous version of this in the US. Um, in other cultures, there are many, many kinds of different relationships like this. Um, and in some cultures more than others, but this kind of found family, chosen family, non-blood related kin, this yes. is a really important thing. And again, playing with that, with the matrilineal and patrilineal yeah. line and like, who who is my father's godfather or my mother's godmother to me? These are really interesting relationships that you can leverage in world building as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And you also get them, as I've said, through things like fostering, but also through things like what's called fictive kinship yeah. in societies where you have initiation rituals. The people who are your cohort in an initiation ritual also end up being a special network yes. um, in the same way that in the society we live in. Um, when you're pregnant and when you're having a baby, you often end up in things like maternity classes or having, you know, a group of mums that all have babies at the same time. And that often ends up being an informal social network that's very important for people. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which societies do this all the time. And, you know, the sky is the limit when you're creating your own world in terms of the different kinds of relationships and cohorts. Military cohorts are another one that are very important. And what if you have women serving in the military? Yeah, absolutely. Then you would have a matriarchal group there, potentially. Absolutely. Um, Hugh Pierre had a great question. What would be the features of a traditional ancient patriarchy in transition to a matriarchy? Or that is aiming to empower magically powerful women that the culture didn't have before. So if if you That's were a really in a, interesting idea. Right. If you were in transition between a patriarchy and a matriarchy, how could that work? I guess is the essence of that question. I don't know. There are all sorts of interesting things that you you could do with that. For example, what if, um, I can't remember the name of the novel, maybe you can remember that amazing novel where women suddenly acquire special powers. Oh, The Power by Naomi. The Power, The Power. That's a really interesting example of exactly that. Yes. Um, yes, so. actually, that's a, that's a great example. I recommend that. They're also turning it into a TV show now, I think. Oh, are um, they? Really the, uh, who's the author again? Naomi Alderman. Don't ask me that's why right. I remember that. But that no, is in but my you're right. I couldn't remember the name. It's a really, really good book. And that is exactly a really interesting example of precisely that. But there are other ways you could do it, too. For example, what if what if women who are priestesses, I don't know, eat special foods that give them special powers or do other things that give them special powers or whatever? I mean, there are all kinds of things that could that could make women have powers that would allow them to take over from men. There are also, and this is what happens in in in, in the power. also in the in in the power, there are also things that could simply weaken men and make them incapable of being of being, as it were, in control anymore. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that we haven't talked about as much, because it's difficult to talk about, is the um, the negative side of this, the violent side of this. Um, uh, violence towards women, historically, very common. Sorry. Hang on. Um, my mother is apparently cooked. We can take her out of the oven. This is what I have now learned. Um, <laughs> So one of the one of the sides of this that we haven't discussed so much is, as I said, um, sorry. <laughs> That's my sister you're now hearing. This has become a whole family event. Uh, in case you're curious. 
Good grief. I'm just going to uh, mute my mother for a moment while she takes a phone call. Um, I will finish that thought. Um, essentially, what uh, what we would be looking at is, um, I think, in that um, example, where there would be a transition between a patriarchy to a matriarchy, how smooth would that be? How vengeful might that be? Who would be the actors who would be aiming for smooth and peaceful transition? And who might be the actors who are aiming for maybe not equality, maybe something more than, something different than? And I think these are the things that we need to consider because um, you know, in those kinds of situations, uh, it's not always smooth. And again, for us as writers, that's often where the story is, right? The conflict is where the story is. So these are things to consider and maybe you want to go there in your story and maybe you don't. That's all about who you are as a creator and a writer. Um, Maddie Holmes says it could also be a slow shift like intergenerationally. Yes, exactly. Uh, which we are now finally seeing with uh, women's rights a little bit. Yeah, which we like. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that is pretty much all we have time for. As you've seen, Professor Lynn Foxhall is an incredibly busy lady, phone ringing <laughs> off the hook. So Lynn, any final thoughts? Well, I, actually, I can call you Mommy. Mommy, any final thoughts on, um, they, they know the cat's out the bag. Final thoughts on um, world building matriarchies. What would you like to leave our beans with? It would be really interesting to build the matriarchy that never was. I mean, for, for many, many years, people imagined that that societies like like the the Neolithic society at Chital Huyuk in Turkey in central Anatolia or yeah. or um, even more Minoan society, the society of, of ancient Crete in the in the Bronze Age were matriarchal societies led by women. Now, we know now that they weren't. But having said that. Having said that, we we um, it would be really really interesting to see what you could do with a society where where women really really do run everything and men become simply subservient. Really, I guess a society of bees. Yeah, absolutely, bees or Borg. I would say yes, exactly. Um, the Borg also had a queen and were a hive. Um, well, thank you so much for that, um, Lynn, Mommy. Um, as you know, I love talking to you anyway, but uh, thank you so yes. much for bringing your expertise to the live stream. Uh, there is a rousing chorus of asking for you to come back sometime. Is that something you might be interested in? I would love to do that. And thank you very much for being such a great community and asking such excellent questions. Right, right. Aren't they awesome and smart? Yeah, I'm so proud they of are. First. Yeah. Um, just before we go, I'd like to remind you that if you missed it, the World Building Awards winners are now released in a blog post. So you can go and check that out. We were hoping to get those up on the website as well. But unfortunately, we've had a dev set up set back as we have been completely refactoring the way we want to present all of those. So there's been a little bit more dev time. But in the meantime, you can check those out on the blog. And of course, since you're there, why not go check out all the fun we had on our meetups yet yeah, this April, we came to see you guys over on the west coast it was a crazy ride the jet lag was real but we had the best time and you can read all about it in that blog over on our blog.worldanvil.com blog um see the pictures learn what crazy <laughs> things we did free the oilies and um learn about our next meetup as well yeah we're coming back in august we will be in the indianapolis area and uh we'll be doing a meetup then can't wait to see you guys um tomorrow we are going live three times three times yes this is insane so at 8 a.m eastern time kids hoi poi will be going live with a stream for play may at 1 p.m eastern that's my cat um <laughs> dead aussie gamer and me and dimitris and kaora and myri stritter from orkish balta tv and our friend kaora will all be going live with who emily armstrong's amazing park ranger one shot from the Adventure April Challenge. We loved it so much, we had to put it on live stream. And of course, at, good Lord, when is it? 
um, 5 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be going live with our third Playmay slot with Wordy Girl, who will be running us through a puzzling adventure. Cannot wait to see that. <laughs> Guys, it's all kicking off tomorrow. All going to be here on the Twitch channel. So make sure you tune in to support the community and uh, probably laugh your butt off. That's what usually happens in these things. They are, they are very, very good fun. And uh, looking ahead a little bit, folks, it's almost summer camp time. Keep an eye out on the socials and on the community because uh, it's all going to be kicking off very, very soon. We've got the homework planned. We've got the prompts planned. We are ready. I hope you are ready too. All of that will be revealed very, very soon. We are going on a raid and our raid shout is light up the forge. So shout it out as we get to ooh, wherever we're going to. Um, second and summer, I will tell you um, to let them know that we sent you. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, you beautiful beams. It remains only to ask you to grab your hammer and go world build. Bye-bye.